Joel Pollack is here, senior editor-at-large at Breitbart News. Joel, how are you, sir? I'm great. How are you? Really good to talk to you. Uh, can, I, can I get your take on some of the things we've been talking about here, and then we'll uh, lead that into your new book, which comes out on August 20th, which when I just saw that, I was like, oh, that's like... That's really far away. August 20th. Why, I feel like we're talking. Oh, that's next week. August 20th is next week. The book is called The Agenda, What Trump Should Do in His First 100 Days. Uh, so I want to get to the book, but some some uh, big questions that we, we've talked about today. I hear, okay. and we talked to Michael Wally, the chair of the RNC, about this earlier. And he talked about the valuable, uh, producer Zach, do you remember I put it, was it the valuable middle or the valuable independent, the valuable, is the valuable something, right? This independent, moderate person and they're very valuable, and we need to appeal to them. And I just want to question that and get your take. Like, should we be going after, and I'm just making this number up, the one million independents, moderates? Should we like, spend time on the one million people we need to convince? Or is there the definite conservative person who goes to church, has a gun, MAGA, MAGA whole thing, who just doesn't vote ever? Should we spend our time on that person? Because there's 10 million of those. What do we do? Well, the answer is yes, because those are all Trump voters. You have to look at them as Trump voters. The Kamala Harris and Tim Walz campaign has alienated the middle, so they're up for grabs. And I say that because Kamala Harris is a far left-wing politician. She chose a far left-wing politician to be her running mate. They're going around rallying Democrats, and Democrats are certainly very excited about Kamala Harris because now they get to vote for a candidate who happens to be alive. Before they were going to vote for a candidate they couldn't sure was, couldn't be sure was alive. So they're very excited. I, you know, the, the word that Harris and Walls are using is joy, but the actual word is relief. Yes. That's what you're seeing among Democrats. So a lot of Democrats who decided to sit this out are coming in off the sidelines. That's why you see the surge of enthusiasm. But there's no enthusiasm in the middle they had a chance to nominate a moderate Democrat from a swing state, one of the few, and they decided not to nominate Josh Shapiro because the anti-Israel caucus inside the Democratic Party, which is loud and growing, decided that he was unacceptable. So she chose Tim Walls to keep the party unified, and they are unified. But in so doing, she cut off any possibility of appealing to Trump voters and to independent or moderate voters. What Trump has to do to win is to rally his own base, first of all. So I hear the skepticism in your voice around these independent or moderate voters. And you're right that they're not the top priority. The top priority has to be to motivate Trump's own voters. But then recognize that there's this middle that still exists, maybe 10% of the electorate, that is actually out there for the taking. They're not yet sold on Kamala Harris and Tim Wallace, despite all the media hoopla, all the propaganda. So they are Trump voters. You have to consider them as winnable voters. And the message has to go out to them over the next few months. The mission right now is for Trump to explain to his own voters that he can win, that even though we see so many elements of a rigged system, we see the rigged democratic process inside the Democratic Party. You know, they call themselves the defenders of democracy, but nobody voted for Kamala Harris. We see it, right? So it's discouraging. But we have to believe, we have to be told to believe and inspired that the Trump vote can overcome the margin of fraud. And in order to do that, you have to sketch a vision of what the future looks like. You have to sketch a vision yes. of what it looks like on January 20th, 2025, when Trump takes office. What can he do right away? And it's no good to tell voters, well, we're going to work with Congress or we're going to kind of reach this eventual goal. It's not good enough because voters know that Congress is unreliable. We learned that in 2017 when Trump was elected the last time. And so you need to tell voters what you can do right away. And you need to give them a vision of what that feels like. What does it feel like when Trump takes office? So that's what I tried mm -hmm. to do okay. in my book. And I think that's what he needs to do now. Okay, this, this is very good. Because my, my second question and, and segue into the book is we hear people say issues, 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 issues. We need to get to the issues. And I'm like, yes, of course. Yeah, yes, I, I love issues. But do people or do, do people care about feelings? But it sounds like what you just did right there is kind of combine the two. Like what, what are the things, what are the issues 
that then result in feelings, <laughs> right? Or how did how did you put that, and and how are those two connected? Well, I think you can divide the two parties fairly accurately by saying that Democrats don't care about issues; they care about feelings, and Republicans care about issues more than feelings. I, I don't think that's too much of a stretch, because when you look at the main issue, what's the main issue in this election? The same issue as at every election, which is the economy. And voters who are choosing Donald Trump say that they believe he will improve the economy. Voters who are choosing Kamala Harris, they might care about the economy, but they don't believe she's going to improve the economy. They're voting for her for other reasons. Maybe abortion, you could say that's an issue, but abortion is really more of a feeling because it's not really about the issue itself. Many of the voters who are pro-choice in that regard, they're not planning to have abortions, but they like the feeling of individual personal control that a pro-abortion stance gives some of them, especially single women. They like that feeling. So I think you're right. You have to combine the two. You have to sketch out what the issues are, how Trump will make a difference, but you've got to do so in a way that lets people believe that what he's saying will actually come to pass. So his audience has to feel like it's going to happen. They have to feel like he's going to win. They have to taste victory. And you know what? It's not impossible. That's what Trump voters felt in April. That's what Trump voters felt in May. And that's what Trump voters felt in July. Trump voters have felt it at several points during this campaign when he's been attacked by the establishment. I sat down to write the agenda in May after he was wrongly convicted in New York of these ridiculous charges. And I said, look, I could be angry about this and I can be frustrated or I can look ahead and have a vision of what the future is going to look like. So that's the space in which I wrote the agenda. And then in July, after he survived the assassination attempt, that's how people felt. The the Republican National Convention was a feel-good week for Republicans. They believed that they were going to win. And then came this big switcheroo a few days later. And that didn't take the wind out of Republican sales. It just puffed up the Democratic sales. There there are no Trump voters who are giving up on him and going to Kamala Harris. There was no movement from right right to left. It's just that Kamala Harris suddenly picked up this acceleration. And it's partly because of the media hype, but it's also just because Democrats were so despondent and so despairing that now they're in for a good fight. And, you know, I I think this is a fight that voters deserve. It's also a fight that Republicans can win, but they've got to get back to that feeling in July of what victory feels like. And again, you do that by focusing on the issues. There's another reason to focus on the issues before I let you barge back into your own Mm -hmm. show here. The other, (laughs) the other reason to do it is that Kamala Harris cannot talk about issues. She fell apart in the 2020 presidential race over issues because she embraced all of these radical left-wing positions that were even further left than Bernie Sanders. And when she was asked to defend them, she couldn't. She could not defend the idea of canceling everybody's private insurance, for example. She could not defend canceling uh, or ending fracking. Now they're trying to run away from that position. But you see, she has no ability to discuss issues. That's why she won't do the unscripted interviews and so forth. So you've got to go there because that's where her weakness is. That's where Trump's strength is. That's where Trump has a demonstrated record of achievement. So go to the issues. And, you know, my suggestion is in the agenda, start with what you can do on day one, start with what you can do as president that you don't need a congressional vote. You don't need to wait for an approval for a nomination process, a confirmation process, they're going to call him a lame duck on day one. If he takes office, they're going to say, okay, well, you know, that's over. Let's talk about 2028. You have to come in with an agenda you can execute on day one. So I'm looking at some of these. Before I ask you, give, uh, to, to, to narrow one down for you, just in general, like give, give, me, give us an example of one that you're excited about, like something he could do quick when he's dictator on day one. Uh, other than the Keystone Pipeline and Build the Wall, what's one of these things on, in the, that you highlight in the agenda? Well, hang on. Other than Keystone Pipeline and Build the Wall, I mean, those are big things. <laughs> I just say that so just because those are the two he mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, those are in my book, by the way. Those are part of the agenda. But, um, <laughs> excuse me, for example, 
I think that he could come right in and issue pardons on day one to all of the nonviolent people who have faced prison terms for January 6th or for other things. And I think that's important because the public doesn't trust the rule of law anymore. The Democrats have corrupted the administration of justice in this country to the point where we don't believe in impartial justice anymore. So on day one, I think he should pardon all the nonviolent offenders. Grandma who walked across the West Capitol lawn should not be in prison or who went into the Capitol through an open door that was held open by a Capitol police officer. That person should not be in prison. They may have had bad judgment or whatever, but they should not be in prison. Not when Alvin Bragg is letting violent anti-Israel demonstrators go in Manhattan and prosecuting Trump. So I think you've got to start with those things. And you mentioned the border wall. Trump can immediately reinstate the remain in Mexico policy. Trump can, mean, it can immediately cancel all of the freebies that Biden has given away, like the student loan relief, which keeps getting extended and expanded. That's inflationary because if people aren't paying their loans back, then they're spending money on other things. And that causes higher inflation. So you can do these things. I mean, you know, Trump can also start White House meetings and press briefings with an invocation. The White House daily press briefing is probably the most widely watched public meeting of any kind in the United States. There's no reason it shouldn't start with a moment of silence or an invocation. And there's nothing in the Constitution that prevents that from happening. There are invocations every day in the House of Representatives and the Senate. But we don't somehow want to demonstrate faith to the American people. It's constitutionally permissible. And that's something Trump could do right now to bring the country together, to restore a sense of faith to daily life, which I think is necessary because we're in the middle of a spiritual crisis in this country. So those are just some of the things I suggest. Yeah. On the uh, pardoning people, I love how you put D- Douglas Mackey, is that how you pronounce his name? This is the guy who, correct me if I'm wrong, sent out a tweet during the 2016 election. Uh, was, was it, hey, um, Hillary voters, or you can you can vote for Hillary by text, just text to this number, and and it made made it look like a real thing, and he was sent to jail, and it, well, I forget the numbers exactly, but wasn't there like a hundred people who texted the number, and like that's it, and they threw him in jail. Yeah, the idea of jailing someone for a joke is ridiculous. Now it's a bad joke. It's not the kind of joke people should make because it does have the potential of confusing people about voting. And it was a stupid mistake, I think, by the person who did it. But you can't imprison someone for a joke. And especially a joke that doesn't harm anybody's physical well-being or cause anyone to lose their liberty or, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. And also, given the many rule changes in voting in this country, it's, it's appropriate, I think, to some degree, to poke fun at the ridiculous nature of what voting has become. Uh, 